Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for hanging with us all day. It's been a long day, mm -hmm. but uh, we know you've been hanging tough just like we have. This is good. So we are the final session of the day, yep. final module, if you will. And uh, we're, we're going to finish up with a, a module called Using Phone Resources, which there are quite a few. <laughs> there are, there a, are lot. a lot of them, you know. I mean, what, what, is this a 10-hour module, this one? Yeah. Is it going to take it's that gonna long? It's going to take us right through, and then we're just going to We're not even gonna, We're not even going to sleep tonight. Start straight up tomorrow. Oh, my God. I'm offline. He's offline. <laughs> Andy's offline. When's the last? If I had a dollar for every time someone said Andy's offline. <laughs> wow. Um, All right. Off his rocker, off the line. Something like that. I'm so, on. I'm on. Yeah. I'm okay. going to play this. Tra so here's the most important part of this is that we're at the last one, number nine. Um, there you go. Yeah. But like you said, it's going to take all night. We're not going to sleep, and then we're just going to press on right into the next day. So uh, it's going to take a lot of caffeine. Mm hmm And then, of course, as I know you've already forgotten, we have a day two. <laughs> and uh, we're going to do... Yeah, I know. Yeah, call me crazy. Uh well, we're going to do the app-to-app -app communication, which is a great way to start out. It's like two people talking to each other, <laughs> you know, passing things, you know, yeah. stuff like that. Andy's favorite, network communication with Windows Phone. I love 8. that session. You yeah. know, it's probably my favorite, too, I think, mm -hmm. you know, yep. but I don't get to do it. <laughs> Proximity sensors and Bluetooth. Oh, that's more demo stress, but that should be cool. A yeah. lot of demo stress. Yeah. You when know. everything works, it's just the complication is how to show you two devices at the same time through, uh, yeah. like, on a, yeah. Speech input. Oh, cool. The That's big, great fun. It, yeah. it is great fun. It's, you know, it's, it's all brand new stuff. Maps and location. We got those great Nokia maps everywhere. Wallet support. We've got a great wallet. We've got NFC. We put it all together. In-app purchasing is a new feature we have for our apps, which is going to help you sell more apps. You could have free apps out there on the store, and then people could do purchase new things once they've already bought it, and they're already falling in love with it. And then the home stretch, we'll talk about the phone store more in depth. Then I'm going to walk you through how to build a Microsoft mobile enterprise application platform. That's a mouthful. And walk through that. And also kind of talk about how you can publish enterprise apps internally. Andy will talk about cross-platform development across Windows 8 and Phone 8. I think you've already gotten some indicators. And we've alluded to how those things might happen by you know common code that you might see. And then to finish it up, we'll do something completely unexpected and un-app-like, and we'll talk about the mobile web. Because we do have this rockin' browser on our device, and I, I can't stress enough how important IE10 is. Yep. App-like performance. Awesome. Yep. JIT-compiled JavaScript. <laughs> Hardware-accelerated graphics and HTML. Yep. So let's dive into this thing. OK. Right. So phone resources. So in, the, in this module, we're going to look at using the contacts and the calendars in Windows Phone, launches and choosers, of which there are many, to actually uh, launch into first-party app experiences, and uh, uh, quite a lot about the Windows Phone camera. Uh, not very much about the microphone. And then we're going to talk about the Windows Phone sensors. Going to focus in that one on the new uh, Windows Runtime APIs, because mm -hmm. we've got a lot of commonality with Windows 8 for that one. Uh, and very brief mention of video at the end. So uh, a bunch of stuff in there and some fun demos. It's probably going to be like one hour per launcher and one hour per chooser. <laughs> That's right. So we're going to be there all through the night. Yes. Right. We're going to start with contacts and calendar. So the first thing, uh, I'm afraid you have to be boring about this, just to remind oh. you of your obligation. Oh. This data belong, uh, yeah. This data is your user's personal data. Contacts, calendar, this sort of thing. This is what they use the phone. And so you do have programmatic access to it. Um, but you need to uh, manage it in a secure way. And it would be completely unacceptable for your application to make a copy of the contact list, upload it to a server, and then sell it for, for gain to uh, a spam company, spamming company. That would be incredibly bad. So uh, please don't do that. Uh, there's some, there's some uh, that box there that you probably can't read uh, at home is uh, one of the, the uh, certification requirements, the application requirements. Uh, which reads, uh, if your application accesses or uploads a user's contacts, photos, phone number, SMS history, browsing history, or any other data reasonably considered personal in nature, or if your application shares any of the foregoing information with third-party services or individuals, or B, shares any unique device or user IDs combined with user information, blah, 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 the application must implement a method to obtain the user's opt-in consent. 
There you go. Stay calm, don't do all this stuff. <laughs> That's right. So there you go, they, it's in the application policies, so you do need to uh, think about what you're going to do with this data. Uh, but the key things here is basically, if you don't upload it to uh, third-party services or individuals, you're clear. If you're just do, using it to add value to an application running on the device and you're not taking it off the device or anything, uh, you're cool. So. Uh, there's some application capabilities that relate to this. So before you use the contacts and appointments data, you need to request the appropriate capabilities. And there's a top two on that list there, ID cap appointments and ID cap contacts. So you need to go into the manifest editor and check those. So contacts and calendar providers, where does this data come from? So one of the really cool things about Windows Phone is that you can obviously configure your device to connect to lots of different information sources. So uh, obviously to uh, Windows Live, which is now being renamed as a, like a Microsoft account, so mm -hmm. your Microsoft account details. Um, Exchange accounts, so anybody who has, access, who has licensed the um, Exchange protocol, which is not just about Outlook, it's also uh, people like Google, Gmail, and that sort of thing. They also use the Exchange uh, protocol. Facebook and aggregated accounts such as Twitter and LinkedIn. And when you go on the People Hub on the Windows Phone, you get all that information amalgamated. So you, you can you see these compound kind of contacts, your, your friends. You see their Facebook details and details that come from their, maybe their Microsoft account, maybe from their Outlook account, all presented on one contact card. Uh, so from a programmatic point of view, what information you are allowed to get at does depend where it's the, the original information source of that data. So you, you get one of these amalgamated things. So this, this table spells it That's the it second out. time he used the word amalgamated. Mm. Yeah, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> it's like a game. OK, all you, right. you carry on, Rob. Yeah. So yeah, from the Microsoft account, you can get the, all the properties, contact name, contact picture, uh, other contact data, and calendar appointments. Similarly, for anybody that's on an exchange or using exchange protocol, uh, mobile operator address book is everything except there's no calendar associated with that. Now, Facebook, you can only get through the APIs, contact name and contact picture. Now, you'll see more data than that. Obviously, from Facebook, you can get a lot more mm -hmm. information about somebody. But this is, uh, this is just about contractual kind of arrangements. Right. So if you want to get at the, the more personal information from a Facebook account, you have to actually set up, uh, you have to you know, go and use their APIs. You've got to authenticate with their, using their APIs mm -hmm. and get access to their, to their the information services that way, not through the APIs that we're going to talk about here. And then the aggregated accounts, there's actually not much information at all you can get from those. So we don't even know why they're on there. No, <laughs> it's no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> now, so if you want to find the information sources that are configured on the phone, you just new up this contacts object, and that has a property on it called accounts, which gives you back an I enumerable of account. And each of those account objects in that collection has a kind property where you can go and find out what that information source was. So there's storage kind dot outlook, uh, storage kind dot uh, dot Microsoft account, and various other ones. So you can go and figure out where which ones are available on the phone as a first thing. And you can then having the next thing you would do again with this contacts API, um, you hook up a search completed event handler, and then call search async. And that will give you, that's an unfiltered search, so that will give you all the contacts that are on the phone. And then you can, you get back in that contact search completed, you get back a uh, contact search event args object, uh, which has a results collection, and you could display that on the screen or whatever, enumerate mm -hmm. that collection to find, to do whatever it is you want to do with that data collection. In this particular example I'm about to show you, we simply show the display name of each of those contact objects using this data template in a list box. So very simple first demo. And here's, here is the main page.xaml, which is the, the UI for this very simple app. Well, that's loading. The, yeah, here we go. So this, this is the code. And this is just shows you how to use that, uh, that contacts object, new upper contacts, um, find out what accounts are configured on the device. Um, also hook up a search completed and call search async. And uh, when the search comes back, go to the definition of that. This is where the search completed event handler is. We should simply show it on the screen. So have a look at the emulator. Uh, 
and of course I just realized there's going to be nothing at all on this at all, so there are no people entered on this, so it's going to be a less than compelling demo, so we can hit this load button, uh, we've got Microsoft account, there are no results available, we have no contacts. Uh, let's just go off and uh, create, create somebody. Yes, we have no contacts. Yes, we have no contacts. Um, so we're going to add, uh, let's add Rob Tiffany, uh, and that will do. And uh, let's uh, save Mr. Tiffany, and there we go, Rob Tiffany has been created. Uh, let's create, uh, uh, in absentia, Mr. Rob Miles as well. Yes. Yeah, there we go. Save that one again, and of course I could save all these other. And uh, there we go. So now I've got two contacts. We can go back to our app and uh, load it again. Yeah. And there we go. Woo! Rob Mars and Rob Tiffany. So, so this is a less than spectacular demo. I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, but you'll I think agree. actually it's a better demo because you made it real. Mm. It could have seemed canned otherwise. <laughs> yes, they could. watched you put them in, and then you saw it on the screen. Indeed. And this is a difference from Windows Phone 7.1 SDK, where in the emulator there, you did get some pre-canned contacts, but we don't have any at all. Um, but actually, you can sync the emulator to a, uh, a proper Exchange account mm -hmm. or Outlook or something. Yes. I have done that. So there we go. That's the first demo. Back to the slides. So before I showed you an unfiltered search, but you can filter the results you get back. There's a filter kind dot display name or filter kind enumeration. There are a number of different filters you can apply. So display name is the default. Uh, you can also uh, filter your search to those that are pinned to start. So you can find out which contacts have been pinned to the start screen. Because it's not only apps, of course. Mm -hmm. We've been pinning apps, of course. But you can, uh, you can pin contacts and groups of contacts and web pages and all so kinds of stuff. So you're talking about pinning people mm. Yeah. Yep. to the start screen. Yeah. Ouch. Yes. <laughs> That's got to hurt. You can search by email address or by phone number. And the first string in the search async method has different meanings depending on what kind of filter you're doing. So here R0, RO, with the display name filter kind, means we're just going to find all the contacts with names beginning RO. It's kind of unfortunate that you put Rob Tiffany and Rob Miles in. Ah. That's all you're doing. <laughs> 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 well, it's, it's just as well I haven't got a demo for this. So oh, well, we then go. never there mind. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you'll get back this I enumerable, which you can then do an additional uh, link query against if you want to do uh, further, further uh, filtering on that. Now then, uh, there's an appointments API which works pretty much the same way. But for the search async for that, you need to give it a date range. So you give it a start date range and a start date and an end date time, and it will return all appointments within that range. So, uh, but in every other respect, the API works in exactly the same way. Um, as with contracts, there's no appointments built into the emulator, so uh, you'll need to, uh, to mm -hmm. you know, when you're testing this, it's probably best to use it on a real phone or, or figure out a way of, of, of creating some stuff. Now then, creating a contact. This is um, a theme that you'll find throughout this deck. An application cannot create a contact without the user getting involved. Now, we, we've kind of seen some of this already. Like when you pin a secondary tile, mm -hmm. the user kind of gets involved with that because the app closes, they get to see it. So it's very explicit that whatever action it is they did in the app caused a secondary tile to be created. Um, now, with things like the personal data, again, this is another sort of feature that stops your application from spamming the contact list and creating loads of uh, first-party contacts. But as you'll see in a minute, uh, applications can create custom contacts for their own use. Uh, and we'll, we'll look, dig into that in a moment. So to create a contact, we use, this is a first experience of something called a chooser API. Um, uh, the chooser and the launchers and choosers are a set of APIs that allow you to call into the built-in apps on the phone. And uh, they are called, it's called asynchrony and generates an event when it's done. So launchers and choosers, uh, there's two, launchers are things that launch, that launch a first party application but you're not expecting anything back. So right. it's just a kind of do it, go ahead and do it. So you can launch the browser or, or something like that. Uh, or make a phone call. So uh, when you launch out to another application, your application is suspended, just the same as uh, if the user had pressed the, the, the Windows button or the lock screen had come up. So you switch to the other application. So in order to get back from a launcher, 
the user has to uh, actually hit the back button to go back to your application. With a chooser, it's kind of the same, but in this case, you are expecting a, a return value. So with a chooser, you launch the first party experience, and it will, when the user has been through it, like take a picture or create a contact, has actually completed the dialogue associated with that action, it will call back into your application. You'll get a return value. So you can get the result or get some kind of a value that indicates whether the user um, okayed the change or, or backed out of it. So creating a chooser, and they all have the same kind of uh, API style. You need to, uh, you must declare the object with page scope. So in your main page, .xaml or whatever, in your class, you need to declare it as a, a, a field on that class. And then you must, in the constructor, you must new that, object, that task up in the constructor, and you must hook up the event handler in the constructor. Uh, and then you just simply uh, initialize the object and call show when you're ready to call it. The show method is what actually initiates, uh, fires that launcher or chooser off. Now, why this rather strange requirement that you've got to new it up in the constructor and got to hook the event handler? Well, this is because, as I said on the previous slide, your application gets suspended when you call out to these, these APIs. Now, it could be, although, you know, we're going to, in this case, we're talking about the creator contact chooser. It will launch into the creator contact dialog, the same one I just used to en enter the two robs there. And, but at that moment, the user could get a phone call, and then they could suddenly think, oh, hey, I need to go and do a calculation, or, or I need to go into OneNote and do this. They could end up doing loads of stuff. Your application could get moved down the history stack, and it could get to the point where it will get tombstoned. And if it gets tombstoned, it could still subsequently get resumed by the same methods that we talked about mm -hmm. before. And it's this recovery from a tombstone situation is why we have this pattern of having to hook this thing up and new it up in the constructor. This is all about making sure that callback happens, because that uh, callback is the event handler that gets called when the chooser returns. So here's the uh, completed event handler. Uh, for the save contact uh, task, all you get back is a task result that says task result OK means the user's OK'd it, or task result .cancel means they didn't. So this is what you get. So before we look at I'm going to look at that in a demo in a minute. Let's talk about the custom contact store. This is a new feature in Windows Phone 8. Um, so the save contact task only allows you, you to create like first party contacts in any of the user's configured accounts. So uh, it can change, change, it can create, by that I mean it, it could create a, an Outlook contact, mm -hmm. or it could create a Microsoft account contact. But, and the user gets involved with that, and they have to OK it and, and save the contact. But the, um, uh, an application can create its own personal contacts just for its own use. But rather weirdly, these contacts do then turn up in the, uh, the People Hub. So you would see them along with all your other contacts. Um, and it becomes, they become first party contacts on the phone. But these ones, the user doesn't get involved. So OK, this is kind of a bit of a departure mm -hmm. in that an application could, in principle, um, create uh, uncontrolledly create thousands of contacts. What this is actually intended to be used for is those apps that are, are mobile apps that are companions for some kind of web experience or something, where you've got a website um, with, a, with its own user community or something that you've created your, um, your own selection of contacts on a web page. Um, something like Comcast, is that that's something you have? It's a cable company. Yeah, between. so that's an example of something that might have your own personal contacts in the cloud. The mobile phone app could download details of those contacts and create them on the phone. Now, those contacts then are linked back to the app. So people, your users would see those contacts in the People's Hub, could tap on it, and launch the associated app. So this is what it's all about. Gotcha. So how you create a custom contact is, first of all, you have to uh, create a uh, contact store with the create or open async method. And then you just new up stored contact instances, uh, set some properties on them. You can there's an extended properties async, so you can put custom properties onto them, and then you just call the save async method on that. So this is this using the new um, awaitable API style. And it, like it says at the bottom there, it does not cause a chooser to be displayed. It's actually just stored directly. 
Um, so a user, an application can search through the custom contacts that it has created. Um, and the, uh, if a user tries to uh, edit one of these custom contacts from the People Hub, then you have this weird uh, linked, account, linked contact uh, experience. This is something that's going to be much easier to show in a demo than it is to explain on a slide. So let's go ahead and just do that. Uh, let's stop that previous one and open the next project solution, which is make a contact. So this sample actually does, in its first uh, iteration, the first bit of functionality on it is exactly the same as the previous demo we saw. So we can load the contacts, and there's the two robs. Um, and then I can put a name into here and create a first party contact. Um, so uh, it's probably time to add myself into this. And then I can hit the Make Contact button. And now we're into the mi new Microsoft account contact. So we're creating a, a like a first party contact, if you like. Um, and I could go in and, and add phone, email, and that sort of thing. But I'm just going just to take my name. That's good enough. Um, now I could save or cancel it. But let's have, just have a look at the code before I do that. So the, um, there's the first bit we're loading there. Here's the Make Contact with the Save Contact task. Uh, we show the completed event handler. Uh, we're looking for the task result OK to see whether it's uh, completed or not. And we're going to put a message box up if it was OK, or uh, you won't see a message box if I cancel it. So if I just cancel it from this is still in the first party, the make a contact, you see it didn't do anything. But I can go back in and do it again, and this time I'm going to save it. And in the event handler, we, we've got, yes, we've done it. Uh, so you see the message box come up. Now, the other one is uh, let's, uh, let's, create, uh, let's create something else. So uh, let's, let's, let's create a custom contact, which is Jeff at the back there, who's uh, the, the tech genius keeps all this work running. Make a custom contact. So this time, I'm going to, um, I'm going to dive into the code and make a custom contact, which is this code here. Contact store, create or open async. We're going to create a new stored contact and save it away. So let's just do that. Make a custom contact. No UI is shown at all. So uh, let's go off and have a look at the People Hub now. Here's our People Hub. And we've got three contacts, as you can see. Or four contacts, sorry. I'm in there. The two Robs. And now this new Jeff, Jeff Cox. So I, Let's choose me first. This is a first party contact, so I can edit and I could go in and I could set my phone number. I'm not going to bother, but you can see there's no great issues with editing that through the first party app. If I try and edit Jeff, this is a custom contact that belongs to this Make a Contact mm -hmm. app. So I can go in to look at it. This is the Make a Contact app. It, you can do all the same stuff that you could do uh, in it. If I do edit, says you can't change make a contact contact info on your phone because it belongs to that app. But what you can do is create a linked contact, which will which is linked up, so you can add details that will appear on this contacts card. And this is how uh, how Windows Phone works with with these contact cards. So it's creating what we're doing is creating a Microsoft account contact that's linked automatically to the other one. So um, let's let's put a, a fancy email. Um, Oh, yeah, keyboard problems. Uh, that Contoso company's in there again. Uh, save it. And you see with personal email has gone there. OK, we've saved it. Now, this is our, you can see now Jeff Cock has got two information sources. It's a Microsoft account and it's a Make a Contact account. But the, what you see in the contact card is the combined details from both of those information sources. And down here, you can see we've got two links. So this is showing that this contact card is actually combined from two different uh, real account uh, records. So that's how it works. All right, back to the slides. There's a number of other save choosers available. So they're only choosers because they return something. So you've got save contact tasks, save email address tasks, there's save phone number, save ringtone tasks. They're actually all choosers.
because they return some kind of a value. So that you can see the ones there. Uh, so just to, com uh, to uh, reiterate what I said before, a chooser allows the get some kind of return value back and a launcher actually launches another app and just that's where you go. The current application is dormant or to Tombstone. So these are all, this is the entire list of the choosers and Windows Phone 8. Um, the new ones are highlighted there. Uh, so there's an add wallet item task which launches the wallet application and adds something into that. You'll see that tomorrow. The address chooser, phone number chooser, email address is all about contacts. Photo chooser to go and pick a picture out from the media store. Camera capture to take a snapshot. Game invite to invite players to a multi-game session. Save contact task we looked at to save a first party contact. Um, save email, and save phone, and save ringtone. The launchers, this is the full list of those guys. So these are the ones where it just launches a first party app and we're not expecting any value back. Uh, so all of these, Bing Maps task and Bing Maps directions task, those actually have been deprecated because they've been replaced by the one four down, which is the Maps task and the Maps directions task. Uh, connection settings task where you can launch into the settings app on the phone to the network connection settings. Uh, send an email with the email compose task. Uh, there's a bunch of tasks for interacting with um, what the Windows Phone store, which used to be called the Marketplace, so th those APIs keep their original names. Play media to play some music. Uh, make Place a phone call with a phone call task. Uh, save appointment task is a new one in Windows Phone 8. You couldn't create an appointment previously, mm -hmm. but now we can. Uh, then we've got share links, share status, and share media. Send an SMS, start a search using Bing, and open a web page with the web browser task. So that's the full list of all the launches. This is the new one, creating an appointment with a launcher. Uh, the save appointment task, uh, you set the start time, end time, a subject, location, details, all those kind of things. Um, and then you call dot show. Now, unlike the save contact task, this isn't a, doesn't return any value, which is kind of strange. Uh, so if you want to find out, you know, if it's worked, you kind of have to call this and then make a make a uh, an appointments query to go and find out what's actually in the store. So that's what it looks like. User can uh, assign the appointment to a particular calendar and then save it. Now, launches and choosers was kind of the uh, old school way of doing things, but there is. Uh, this new method called launch URI async, which is in the Windows Phone runtime, and you get this uh, you get this method on Windows 8 as well. Uh, so this is an alternative to the launcher API. So you can use the launch URI async method as well as an alternative. But some of the newer stuff that's coming along will only be available through this method. So th here's a good example of the uh, lock screen settings dialog is one of the new dialogs only available through launch URI async, not through a chooser API. Uh, this is the list of URIs that you can use to launch some of the built-in apps. Um, so as you see, we can launch the web browser. So you could do that with the web browser task. Uh, mail to email address, and also you can put other stuff in, in the query string parameters. And then various MS settings URIs you can use to launch into the specific AirPlay mode, Bluetooth, cellular, email, and count. So some, some of the kind of fine-tuned mm. settings uh, dialogues that are in the phone settings APIs. Uh, and the Wi-Fi one. And there's a whole bunch as well which are all about uh, diving into the Windows Phone store, finding uh, review app, going to the review page for the calling app, and going to uh, searches for specific content, search for apps or search for other apps by the same publisher. So all good ways of getting, uh, connecting your user to uh, other stuff that you have written or into the, to encourage them to enter review details. So that's the end of the contacts and appointments and those, those kind of user data uh, APIs. We're going to switch tack a little bit now, uh, talk about alarms and reminders on Windows Phone 8. So these are, these are again, part of the phone infrastructure as well that you can take, make, take advantage of uh, with, from your applications. So these are obviously time-based on-phone notifications. I'm sure you're all familiar to uh, creating alarms and reminders on the phone. You can do this programmatically. There is a limit, there was a question on this, a limit of 50 alarms and reminders at any one time per application. Um, what's the difference between these? Well, an alarm, title always says alarm on it, that's not customizable, but you can customize the sound. You can put your own oh. MP3 file with them. 
Um, they have a, snooze, a standard UI, sound, snooze and dismiss. Uh, and if, you, if the user taps on that alarm, it will launch the app at the, the standard main page. Reminders, here you can actually customize the, the title. Um, but the, the sound that it will play is whatever the user has selected currently for reminders in the phone settings. That's not customizable from you as an app developer. Uh, again, snooze and dismiss, so standard UI for that sort of thing. Um, but the deal here is these are deep linked. So uh, you can have a URI associated with a reminder you've created. And if, if the user taps on it, although to be fair, there's no uh, URI to uh, tell the user that this is possible, then it will launch at that specific page in your application with whatever you've specified in the query string. Now, as a simple little example of this, uh, we've got a rather poor example of the usage of, a of, a, uh, of a, uh, an alarm. It's a, it's a, you set the time with a slider and then uh, press the start timer button to create the notification. When the notification fires, it's actually going to, it's deep linked to, the, to a second page on this app, which simply says your egg is ready. Um, there's some scope for improving the UI on this one, to be honest. <laughs> uh, egg, egg timers are in big demand still, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. Huge. Okay, yeah. all right. It's actually surprisingly, I'll explain when we run the demo, why Certainly. it's surprisingly difficult to do uh, in program, in code. So here's the deal. If you, you have to new up a reminder object, uh, you give it, obviously, the, the string there is the title uh, of it. You give it the time. Begin time is when you want that alarm to fire, the reminder to fire. The content is the text that sees on it. And then you have a recurrence type. So recurrence interval dot none means it just fire it once. Uh, but you can have um, all the standard recurrence that you'll have with any reminder. So it could be, uh, is it hourly, or daily, weekly, monthly, annually, yearly. So you've got different recurrence intervals. And then there's that navigation URI, which you pointed at a specific page in your application. There's no query string parameters on that, but you can definitely can add them if you wish. And then this is our, do you remember the uh, scheduled action service? Mm, uh, this I don't is even know the what same that means. guy, the same guy that runs our background agents. So this is a phone service, and we're adding a reminder object to that service. So at this point, the OS takes over. Okay. So this is a persistent reminder. You could pull the battery out of the phone at this point and reboot the phone and restart it, and this will still work. So these aren't volatile bits of information. Once they're registered with the OS, they're there and they're persistent. It's probably saving it in SQL CE. Yeah. Probably. It could well be. Maybe. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> now, here's the deal. Because these are OS entities, because you registered this with the OS, um, it's not enough just to let the thing fire and then think it's all done. Mm -hmm. So you actually have to, If it, uh, there is a limit of 50 of these things can be stacked up per app per time. But that includes ones that have already expired, if mm -hmm. you like. So you've got to have code in there that will um, do housekeeping. You've got to remove them again. Because they're persistent entities, you've got to programmatically find them and remove them in just the same way as you've, you actually create them in the first place. Uh, if you forget to remove them, your app will continue working for a while, and then suddenly you'll try and create a 51st one, and you'll get an exception because you've exceeded your quota. So you've, you've got to write code to it. Kind of like when you run out of DHCP IP addresses, your yeah. lease exhaustion. Lease exhaustion, yeah. Yes. That's, a, that's a good analogy, Thank for you. sure. Uh, so there we go, we find it. Now, this particular sample uses the string egg timer, but actually I would recommend using a GUID or something. That might, of be, a, course. might be a better way of getting a, <laughs> a unique name for this thing. Yes. But this is a simple example. So um, the demo, let's, let's run this little demo. Open the next one. Here we go, egg timer. Yeah, must have copied it off the web somewhere. Uh, the egg timer, so I'm just going to run it first and then we're, then we're going to talk about it because we have to wait for a few minutes before it fires, so I've got plenty to talk about. Uh, here we go, the main UI starting up, this is very exciting, and uh, no, we're not going to wait five minutes. No. No, we're not. Two minutes, how about Ooh. that? It's going to be a pretty runny egg. <laughs> yeah. Start the timer, and, and actually, of course, now it's, we can close the app. Very good. If I stop debugging as well. Uh, now, while we're waiting for that, uh, let's just have a look at the code. Now, the, uh, the reason why this is actually not a great app is that the, the resolution of these timers is not, you know, to the second. We're talking about plus or minus. There's a 
a range of times that it could fire. And this is just dependent on load on the device or, you know, kind of what it feels like doing. So a chef probably would not want to use this if they wanted to... If you only eat eggs, you, you know that you want your eggs to be done right. three and a half minutes, four minutes, and it's exactly right. This app will probably disappoint. Did you say exactly right? <laughs> I thought that's what I heard. Yeah, that was pretty bad. I'm trying to throw in some corny jokes here. <laughs> you know? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Good. Uh, it's cheesy. Still, still isn't quite cheesy, yes. Cheesy jokes. Yeah, now the code to, to register that uh, was down here. So here we, we, uh, here we go. We find whether we got one already. If it's, if it's not, if we already got one, we remove it. Uh, and that only needs to be unique in your app. It doesn't need to be unique kind of, you know, system wide or anything. And then we uh, new up a egg reminder. Uh, and there's the navigation URI to the egg ready page, which actually is a pretty boring page, to be honest. It just simply has a, uh, it has a title on the page just to show that we've actually ended up there. So, like I said, there's some scope for improving the UI on this sort of thing. Probably at next year's Jumpstart event, next year, you'll have a new and improved uh, page two. Unlikely, but there you go. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, like I said, two minutes we were waiting for. Um, Let's remove that. We're two minutes, give or take. Give or take, yeah. So anything between 1 minute 30 and 2 minutes 30, probably. The end of time. Or four, three minutes, perhaps. But, yeah. So... End of Mayan calendar. It, well, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. That's going to be a... a yeah. <laughs> mm. Wow. Mm. So... There oh, it is. Hey, there we go. It is. So we could, should I snooze it for five minutes? No, no, no. no, no. So uh, this reminder, I could snooze or dismiss it, but I'm actually going to tap on it to show that we, um, we open it up at the Egg Ready page. Woohoo! Oh, there we go. This really works. It really works. But the only thing you could say on that is that, uh, yeah, it's gone now, having, having hit the link. Um, it's, there's nothing, like I said, in a reminder UI to suggest to the user that you tap on it and right. it opens the app. But uh, still, that's uh, another way of potentially launching your app. Uh, there we go. So, back to... Uh, it seemed pretty accurate. Do you think so? I it was good enough. It was close enough, I guess. You know. Yeah. I'm probably not the egg connoisseur that you might be. There we go. So, that was uh, reminders and alarms. Now, moving on to the camera. Uh, the camera is a pretty rich topic, so um, I haven't got time. You could easily spend... Would you like me to spend a long time? To... No, we're not going <laughs> to... Uh, we're going to just uh, give, you the, give you the essence of this one. There's a couple of very interesting things with the camera. We've got a whole bunch of new functionality in Windows Phone 8. Now, the old school way of doing anything, camera capture task is a way of simply launching the built-in camera and allows you to take a snapshot effectively. Uh, very simple to use. We'll show that in a minute. Uh, well, in fact, it's the one we used right in the very first demos of today. I, which seems I think like a long already time ago. used it. Yeah, we have already used it. Now, there's another object called the photo camera class where you can actually capture photos or you can actually capture the video stream. So you can actually capture frames from the video stream coming directly from the, uh, the camera hardware. So you could use that for uh, product recognition or augmented reality. There's, this is the new one. The photo capture device class is for advanced photo capture, which has a load of properties on it. You can drill down, right, and change the ISO, the... Uh, uh, the speed, you know, and loads of all the very fine control of the camera hardware on the phone. Um, and there's an audio video capture device for advanced video capture as well. Now, the other thing as well, if you've got a real-time video processing application, something that is grabbing frames from the camera video stream and doing some processing them in real time, you can actually register your application as what's called a lens. Uh, and I'll show you what that means uh, in just a moment. So first of all, the simple one, camera capture task. Uh, it has a, just works the same as the others, call cameratask.show and we have a completed event handler. Uh, no great surprises there, there's our event handler. You get back a photo result object and in that you have the original file name so you can go and get the capture, the temporary image that has been captured and do stuff with it. So here we are taking that file name, uh, newing up a bitmap image and using that as the source for an object that has a name of photo image. That is actually just an image tag in your XAML. So that's the simple one. Now, 
this is the one the way you're capturing uh, uh, frames from the video stream in real time. So you can actually access the video data directly and capture a frame and then uh, create a customized viewfinder or or use it to try and you can capture an image and then try and do barcode scan recognition or, or that kind of stuff. Um, Photo Camera Class provides camera control and access to that. And the way it works is this. So first of all, it's in the Microsoft.Devices namespace and the Photo Camera object is the one you want. You'll new that up and I, you see that next slide, set the video brush source to the camera. This is, how you, this is all you need to set up a real-time viewfinder. I'm just going to switch to the next slide for a minute and then come back to this. So this is your XAML. So here we've got a rectangle and we are filling that rectangle with a video brush object. And that video brush has the name of viewfinder brush. And that's what we're setting the viewfinder brush dot set source method. And we, all you need to do is point it at that photo camera instance and hey presto, you've got a real time viewfinder. Uh, if you want to capture images, you can hook the capture image available method uh, uh, event. So that's what that last line of code is doing on there. Um, that was the XAML, so uh, I'll just skip over that. Then when you want to capture, actually take a snapshot from it, you can call the capture image uh, method on that. So that's the event handler for the photo button, and uh, it asks the camera to take a picture. Then when you've got your image, you can do stuff with it. I'm just going to show you three different options of what the sort of things you can do. You could save the picture to the camera roll using the media library, which is in the Microsoft.xna.framework.media namespace. So still you're, still, you're still allowed to use that? You're still allowed to use that. OK. Yeah. Uh, so there's yeah, a couple of XNA uh, methods are still retained, even for pure Windows Phone 8 applications. Oh, good. So this okay. has nothing to do with XNA games. It's, kind okay. of, it's one of those things, a hangover from where we came from. So you can save it to the camera roll like that. Oh, what's that code? There's something weird in that code. File name, I think it should have been comma e, e dot image stream or something. Yeah. Uh, or you could simply load it into a bitmap image like that and show that on the screen in an in image element. So picture image there is an image element. Saves the image into a bitmap image which is displayed on the screen in an image. Or you could save it into your local folder. So this is using the isolated, isolated storage APIs uh, to do just that. Uh, so it uses that uh, bitmap image that we created on the previous slide, uh, loads it into a writable bitmap, and then we call the dot save JPEG method on a writable bitmap. So you can save that image away into a file just that's private to uh, to your application, so into your local folder. So that's different from saving it to the camera roll, which is the user's kind of you know pu public. Uh, picture library. So, um, a little demo of the in application camera. Uh, which is less than compelling on the emulator. The next one I'm going to do on a real camera. Oh, excellent. Yeah. So there we go. Uh, let's just um, switch it around. So the UI from this, we've got a rectangle on the left where we actually have uh, fired up the camera hardware. And this is the video stream that is coming from the emulated camera. Uh, so we're showing that uh, on, the, on the left side there. So look at the, uh, the XAML for this guy. And on the right, so here we've got our XAML. We've got the uh, rectangle with our viewfinder brush in it. That's what we saw on the slides. And then we've got an image element on the right, which is where we're going to show the image, the, the picture when we've captured it. And the photo button uh, is where we uh, are capturing the image from the stream. So that's the code we just looked at on the slides. So I can capture an image when we're ready, and it shows what was captured on the right. So this is a simple example, but it shows how you can actually tie into the, the main video stream uh, and capture that image. That's a little example. 
uh, which is interesting enough, I guess. But what's more interesting is what we're going to do next. If we can go back to the, uh, the slides. There we go. So this is new in Windows Phone 8. You can actually get one of these real-time video processing uh, uh, applications and, and register it as a lens. And what happens when you register it as a lens is it will integrate into the built-in camera application on the phone. And the user can uh, select a lens uh, from the, uh, the ones that are installed on the phone and use that to, to kind of, uh, it's just like sticking a, a real, op real optical lens onto the front of a real camera. It, it's doing some kind of processing, so wide right. angle or, or funkifying it. We're going to create a funky camera. This is another Ro Rob Miles production. So first of all, how do we register as a lens? All you need to do is put another one of those extension elements into the extensions element in your manifest. This one is the, the extension name has to be camera capture app like that, and the consumer ID and task ID just just use that just same use thing. Just use that exact same thing. Yep. And you need to provide some icons for the lens. So these are going to be shown on the UI in when the user um, uh, when the user looks at what lenses are available. And uh, you need to supply three in this case, one for each Windows Phone screen size. And uh, then what we're going to do is um, when the app is launched, you need to create a URI mapper to direct the application to the page. Now, URI mappers we're going to talk about in more detail tomorrow, so I'm not going to talk a lot about this. But essentially, your app will be launched from the built-in camera app. You need to create a little bit of plumbing to make sure that this thing starts out up. So uh, this is, we're going to use the photo camera class as well, which is the same one we just used. But this time, uh, what we're going to do is grab frames from it and process them in real time to make a, uh, a distorted image. So what we're going to do is for every pixel in each frame that we grab, we're going to get the uh, alpha, the red, the green, and the blue elements of that and just shift them. So we're going to distort the coloring of it. Uh, that's what we're going to do for every single frame and every pixel and every frame that we capture. Now, what we do to start the uh, the camera, uh, we um, uh, we uh, new up the photo camera object. Uh, we create ourselves a writable bitmap, which is just uh, the destination for the process frames. And then we want to find out when the camera hardware has started. So we hook up the initialized event handler and then start it, start the thing running. And then when the camera initialized uh, method fires, we're going to start this new background thread, start it up. This is going to be doing our processing. And what we do in there is we create an integer array to capture the, uh, the captured frames. And what we do is we call the camera.getPreviewBuffer ARGB32 method, which grabs a frame and it sticks it into that integer array. And then we do that, uh, that processing that we just looked at to shift the ARGB elements of each, ele each, um, each pixel in that frame. And when we've got that, we can copy it back to that writable bitmap, and we invalidate the bitmap. And the bitmap itself is, is actually linked to um, what the, the image element on the screen. So you'll see it update in real time. So now this one. Um, I'm going to run the, uh, so you can see what's going on. So I've got on uh, the uh, device, uh, I've got the Funky Camera uh, Lens app. So you, it's a regular app, of course. So you could run it from the apps menu like this. And, uh, and it will, there we go. So you can actually start seeing, there's my, there's my laptop, you can see. Wow. You can see the funkified version on the it's end. It's very funkified. Yeah. But actually, uh, that's... That's not how I want to run it. So I'm actually going to start up the regular camera app on the phone. This has been registered as a lens. And you'll see there's a load of buttons at the bottom. Uh, and the left-hand one, the arrows going left and right, is lenses. So if I hit that, this is where we can see what lenses are installed on this particular device. So Bing Vision is one for doing uh, 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 barcode recognition. Barco yep, that's right. Absolutely. Um, there's a few other. Panorama one is, a, is one that's from, from Nokia, which allows you to do panorama apps. So you can see how you can just stick. Uh, it's like putting a physical app, but Funky Camera is the one we want to run. Absolutely. So this is going to fire up our application, and it takes over. And you know, so you, the user is using it from, the, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from within the, the built-in camera app. 
And now you can see this is our studio. Wave, guys. There we go. Oh, yeah, there we go. There's our, there's our team. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there's, there's Mr. Tiffany over there in uh, glorious Technicolor. Yes, yes, I feel like Andy Warhol or something now. Yeah, it's, it's clear, it's not bad. Why though, do post processing when you can do it in real time like this with huh. the lens? Exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah. I can think of lots of apps that are going to come out of this. Yeah, sure, absolutely, yeah. And then, of course, you'd probably want to tie, you hook this up to some kind of uh, take picture, so you'd capture a frame or whatever. It, maybe open it to some kind of new social network you've created for funky photos. Ah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, share it's with people. bound to bound to catch on. I think it will. Yeah, you might get acquired for a billion dollars <laughs> by somebody. It could happen. Yeah, it could happen. There we go. Uh, all right, so let's move on. Uh, this is another new Windows Phone 8 feature. You can create an auto-uploader for photos as well. You can create an application that has an auto-upload behavior for pictures that the user may take. Uh, the upload behavior, this actually is a, is a, a regular resource-intensive background task. Yeah, okay. So the idea when you're plugged into the mains, uh, it can take any pictures the user has captured and uh, will um, we'll upload them to your cloud service. But you have to write all the code to do the, the transfer and everything. Uh, so, but uh, to register it as a photos auto upload, you just simply put this into the extensions element, and then it will turn up again in the cameras in the settings where there's by default you see um, upload to SkyDrive, but you can uh, you can have other ones as well. Right now we're going to tackle the subject of using the microphone, and yes, there is one. There we go. That was it. All right, it's yes. like a dictaphone. Yeah, no, yes. I, I, we, we haven't got a lot of time to cover that. So, um, uh, it, no doubt, yeah, you'll realize, of course, we can capture audio. So um, just have a look at the documentation for that one. Uh, a quick little thing, just to finish on sensors. There are a number of different sensors on the phone, accelerometer, compass, gyroscope, inclinometer, and orientation. And all of these sensors are used in the same way. They fire an event when they have a reading. Uh, we've got two APIs for calling this, the Microsoft Devices.Sensors, which is the old way of doing mm -hmm. it, and we've got a Windows Runtime API as well, Windows Devices.Sensors. So I'm going to concentrate on the new one. Yeah. Uh, so the new one here, that's the namespace for these, and there you can see all the classes that we've got there. The Orientation Sensor is an interesting one, because this is sometimes known as Sensor Fusion, because it combines data from diff different physical sensors and gives you... Um, Combined and uh, combines those results to give you uh, accurate uh, re readings from based on the combination of the other ones. Uh, they all work in the same way. So I'm just going to take one specific example, which is the gyrometer. You call, first of all call the get default method. That will either return an instance or null. So if there isn't any hardware like that on the device, you'll get null. Uh, otherwise, you will get the uh, the gyrometer, and then you need to set um, if you set the report interval to a number of milliseconds, you are, you are kind of choking the number of change, change events that get fired, and then you need to hook up the reading changed. And actually, that's all you need to activate that hardware. Once you've hooked up the reading changed event, it will start feeding you details, and it will keep on doing that until you unhook that event or you just you destroy, you, you null out the reference to that object, so release your references to it. So this is how you like say how you start and stop them. Um, you have to set the report interval to a non-zero value before you register the event handler. Um, or there is a get, or there is another me method which we'll look at on the next slide where you call get current reading. Both of those activate the hardware, and then when you're finished with the sensor, you can set that report interval back to zero, um, uh, and that will that will stop it from operating. Uh, Here's the sensor reading changed event, so you'll just get you get an args that's specific to whatever a sensor it is you're 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 working with, um, and you can pull out the values that are appropriate for that uh, particular sensor. Um, this is the polling technique rather than using the event. So you can call get current reading as a one-shot thing. So you can actually poll, which is normally how games tend to work with sensors. They tend to have a polling model, so this would be more appropriate for, for gaming kind of solutions. That was very quickly on sensors. Um, we're also now just going to wrap up this session by talking very briefly about video content. So first of all, uh, there is this media element, XAML element, which can play video. You can incorporate that into your UI. Uh, 
That will play a resource file which has, has been included as content in your application. Uh, there's a wide range of supported codecs, so you can go look in the docs and see the, uh, the range of codecs that are supported on the phone, but it, it is a pretty exhaustive list. So very simple to, uh, to play a video like that. Uh, you could also stream video from, uh, the, uh, uh, from the, the internet, so you can simply just set, set the source property and point it at some resource out onto the internet. Uh, this, uh, you can obviously program that, and uh, autoplay equals true means as soon as it gets the video stream, it will start playing it. But of course you can, there's all the standard transport methods that you can call, pause, stop, and all this, the rest of it. Uh, there's also a smooth streaming solution, um, which you can find, there's, this is a server-side and a client-side solution. Mm -hmm. So what this is doing is um, uh, it, it modifies the quality, the, con the, the, the bandwidth of the signal that it's sending according to network conditions. So if you've got a poor quality uh, connection and the client can't keep, is not getting enough frames, it's getting missed frames, then they kind of communicate with each other and the video will drop the quality or stop sending it so much data. So the idea is that it will keep playing the video, but the quality will deteriorate until we get the, the bandwidth improves again. So it's a, it's a coordination between the server side and the client. Uh, go and have a look at smf.coplex.com. Um, there's also HTTP smooth streaming, which there are third-party solutions available for supporting that on Windows Phone 8. Uh, so you can go and have a look at those solutions as well. Okay, so that was a lot of stuff about integrating with some of the hardware, some of the capabilities that are built into the phone, uh, all the launchers and choosers, the camera, the video, um, and a uh, couple of different things like the new lens capability for integrating with the, the built-in camera app. Lots of stuff to talk to. Lots of stuff, yeah. Tap into, yeah. that's awesome. Wow, what a day. What a day. We so this it. is it. We, we made it. it. We made it. So that's the end. We don't have to come back tomorrow, do we? I'm afraid we do. Oh, yeah. right. Gotcha. No, I'm pleased to say we do, because we I... have a bunch of great content for you, content for you tomorrow it's as well, starting with app-to-app -app communication, then yeah. network comms, great stuff, OData, and Azure Mobile Services. Don't miss that. That's Whoa. a load of fun. Um, oh, yeah. NFC, Tap to Connect. Uh, yeah, that's right. Loads, like of, loads of fun. It's Speech. Loads, Speech. Of, loads of really interesting, fun stuff tomorrow. So we hope very much that uh, you've enjoyed. Any of you who've stayed with us all day, Great. Good, Give good yourself on a hand. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to program my phone with speech so that it's just going to talk on my behalf tomorrow. <laughs> so we're going to have your phone on your chair. Instead. Absolutely. Yeah, that'll be, be good sitting to see. Here, good right? to see. Yeah. Right. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll hope to see you again uh, bright and early tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> see you tomorrow morning. All right.